Uh, this morning, uh, we are privileged to have among us uh, Reverend Timothy Yaden, the district president for New England. Um, as I've said at all the other services, we, we have a self-affirmation Sunday here, is that uh, a wonderful man of God, uh, we were blessed as a district to have President Caroline in for a very, very long time. Uh, we are blessed now to have uh, President Yaden now for almost two years. Different temperaments, uh, same love of the Lord, same desire that other people would come to know uh, who this Jesus is and would come to receive all of his gifts of grace. And so we welcome you uh, among us this morning. And he was kind enough not only to come this morning, but I said, we're in the midst of this series, Portraits of Grace, and would you be willing to uh, join us in this series? And so he is going to be preaching on John chapter 8 this morning, the woman caught in the act of adultery, uh, more so Jesus caught in, in the act of grace. And so uh, really a, a well done message. You will be blessed by hearing that this morning. Uh, before we engage in worship, lift up our voices in song. We take a moment to greet one another. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yes. You need a what? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's like the oh, yeah. I know, me too. Because then you run, yeah. yeah. And you gotta put your seatbelts on and everything. As we begin our worship this morning, uh, our songs were chosen from the sense of this idea of thinking of this woman's perspective, of, of, of the shame that she would have had and the humiliation in part that was there, but yet the hope that then she received in Jesus Christ. And so he indeed, he indeed did save the day, which is what we're just going to sing. The day that she came to him and sought his forgiveness, but then the day that he saved all of us from our sins on that cross of Calvary. And so then as we go from this into singing that he is the Messiah, we'll say that he became sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. That is the hope that we have of this Christ that we've gathered to worship together this morning.
open wide the crystal gates. You saved the day. You tore the holy veil away. You open wide the crystal gates. You saved the day. reading from John's Gospel, the 8th chapter. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and rode on the ground. At this those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. This is the gospel of the Lord.
this morning, Father, that you, the highest praise belongs to you and you alone because of all that you've done. That is why with the psalmist, we lift our eyes up to the heavens and to the mountains, and where does our help come from? But it comes from you, the great maker of heaven and earth, the great redeemer, the great savior, for which we have hope and purpose and life and forgiveness today because you have saved the day. Today is the day of salvation. Thank you for your great love for your great truth, and for the hope that we have as we've gathered in your name. All of our hope is in you. All of our peace is in you. The life that we have is because of you and for you. So enable us by your grace to continue in our praise during these moments, during these holy moments set apart for you. For you are worthy of every bit of praise that we could ever offer back to you. Enable us by your spirit. Enable us by your grace to love you and worship you during these moments because of and in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please be seated as we continue in our worship, as we continue to hear the words of our living Lord. The Old Testament reading comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 34, beginning with the 11th verse. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, 
Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and save those, saves those who are crushed in spirit. A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems his servants. No one will be condemned who takes refuge in him. This is the word of the Lord. The New Testament reading comes from Romans chapter 8, beginning with the, eight, the first verse. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord.
Gracious Father, David's acknowledgement is our own that we have sinned and sinned against you alone. And so too is our cry that you would create in us a clean heart and that you would not take your Holy Spirit from us, but that you would restore to us the joy of salvation. And ask that you would continue to bring us to the foot of the cross, acknowledging that Jesus is the source of our salvation and the reason for our joy. And even as we rejoice in what we've received through him, we acknowledge that there are many who are yet apart from Jesus. And so we ask that these gifts would be used for your kingdom purposes, that those who already trust in him would grow in grace and knowledge, and that those who are yet apart from him would have the privilege of hearing the gospel And we pray that by your Holy Spirit that you would work in their hearts in such a way that they too would confess Jesus as Savior and Lord. We pray these things in his holy and precious name. Amen. Invite the children to come forward at this moment for a conversation with President Yaden. The choir told me earlier don't, no offense, President Yane, but as soon as you get up, we're leaving. <laughs> I heard them sing beautifully at the first service. And uh, you were wonderful, and you were wonderful this service, too. Uh, I'm, I don't know where you guys go, but you're going to miss some magic choir. You're going to miss a, <laughs> the ma- doing a little bit of magic with the kids here today. And uh, I'm going to need the help. I need, you know, Pastor, you're never on the receiving end of a children's sermon. I'd like you to be one of the kids. Come on up here because uh, I'm going to need your help. Trust me, every Sunday I'm on the receiving end of the right. children's message. <laughs> uh, and you know what? Can, would I be all right if I ask your son? I know you're not a kid anymore, Micah, but would you help your father out with this one here? Because I have a, a very special rope here that I'm going to hopefully, if it works right, do some magic with. And I'd like you to take one end, Pastor, and... Mike could take one end and stretch it out because I want the people to see that it is a regular rope. Pull it tight so they know I haven't fiddled with the rope or anything like that. Okay, I want you guys here, and thank you for letting me be here today as a visiting pastor. Uh, I hope the microphone is on. Is it working, working correctly? I've messed up twice today with this mic. Uh, if you're hearing me okay, then I'm good. I'd like you to imagine that this is a picture of our life, nice and smooth. Nothing wrong with it at all the way God made us. And it's a pretty neat picture of a life with no knots in it, nothing wrong at all. But unfortunately, if I can have both ends, along comes Satan and he kind of tempts us and starts mixing things up. And then it gets a little more convoluted if we we listen to him. And ultimately, guys, if we really listen to him, What sin does is it severs our relationship with God entirely, cuts us off from God. And so what we try to do sometimes is tie it all back together before God. And maybe that'll be good enough and we grab one end again. And we hold it tight. And I want you guys to pull tight so that the knot is good. And you look at that and say, you know what? I don't think we're fooling God. He sees the sin in our life. And if this works, here comes the magic. Sometimes we look at the sin of our life and say, maybe God won't see it if we move it over here. Or maybe God is over here. Let's put it closer to the pastor because he's godly. <laughs> now, now God. <laughs> now God. Now God. Now God won't see our sin at all. But you know what? It doesn't work that way. The only thing we can do is what do you say? What do you say we ought to do with the sin in our lives? Anyone have a good idea? Make it disappear? Well, you know what? I can't do that, but I know somebody who can take our sin away from us. You know who his name is? Someone back there. 
someone said it. Someone said the name of Jesus. You know, we're going to find out about a woman today who had a problem with sin in her life. And Jesus took it away. And Jesus comes to our lives with his hands that were nailed to a cross for each of us. And he says, give me all your sin, Pastor. And he takes them. We take our sin. We lay them at the feet of Jesus on the cross. And in God's sight, we're back to being the way he wanted us to be. That's the message of forgiveness. When God sees you, no more sin, no more mistakes in any of your life because Jesus Christ took them all away. Thanks, Pastor, for being a kid today. Thanks for returning to childhood, Micah. And thank you all for helping me this day and for letting me be with you today. You can go back to moms, dads, or those who loved you and brought you to church today. And uh, now I want to first say thank you for letting me be with all of you today. Uh, some of you might have heard my story or I've, I've shared with you before. Um, I've been in New England uh, for 30 years uh, as a pastor primarily. And in all those 30 years, I have never once been in this building till today, uh, which is a, just a joy for me to be here today. I've known your pastor and his family through the years. But never having been here till this very day, uh, for 28 years, I, I came out of the seminary. I served only one church. Uh, Pastor was right. For 28 years, I was privileged with serving the Lord at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in New Hartford, Connecticut, way up in the northwest hills of Connecticut. And then for two years, in ways that I, I can't quite fathom, the dear Lord, through pastors and people of New England, have given me this new role. Uh, in my life and in the lives of our church is that of being district president. And, and I thank the Lord for it. I'm only beginning to understand what he was doing in my life. Um, I thought I would just spend my whole life in New Hartford and they'd take me out and, in a box and that would be it. One word of caution, don't ever tell the Lord you think you have your life figured out because he takes that as a personal challenge. Uh, <laughs> And I love being district president. Uh, I am thankful to know your pastor and you. And, you know, speaking of your pastor, this is the third time he's going to hear this today, so he's probably saying, please, not again. But portraits of grace, portraits of Christ, I guess. I want you to know that you have a portrait of Jesus Christ in that man over there. And I'll also say in his wife, Paige, and in his son here, and his son Noah back there, as well, and that's a picture of Jesus and his love that is worth seeing, and it's my privilege to say that to him today, and I'm grateful for a chance to thank him for, for uh, being that way. And I, and I believe he'd be the first one to say, and I see pictures of Jesus in every one of these people before you, President Yaden, and that's a wonderful thing as well. Today, we're going to see a picture of the real Jesus Christ and in his forgiving love. Uh, the story, I love this story. It's, it's not one of those good stories where you go, oh, that's great. Hey, a woman caught in adultery, they're going to stone her to death. Oh, it just gets you right here, doesn't it? Um, no, it's a tough one. But the way it turns out, this amazing love of Jesus where you think, okay, does he throw out the law of God and not care about her sinfulness? Does he care about the law and not care about her? And he found a way. Jesus Christ found the way to keep integrity, to keep the law of God, and yet he, he literally got, the, got this poor, beaten, uh, condemned woman off the hook, as he does with every one of us because of his mercy and love. Uh, I'd like to read again, if I can, Pastor read it already, the gospel lesson. I'd like you to hear again some special things to keep in mind. I love St. John. He drops little hints of things that I, I was only, thanks to Pastor asking me to preach on this text, I, I, by God's mercy, I saw some of these things. Think about what time of day this is happening. I'll give you a hint. It's early in the morning, at dawn, at daybreak. Think to yourself, what else happened at dawn at daybreak one time? Well, I won't tell you what it is. Uh, if you come back in three weeks, you'll really hear a lot about it. Uh, think 
about to, as you saw, it said in your, your uh, slide up there, he straightened himself up. Jesus is doing aerobics exercises, down, up. He's sitting, he's stooping, he's writing, he's up, he's down, he's up. Like that old song, Alleluia, 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 you know, here praise you and you're up and down. He's doing all of that. What's all the up and down all about? Just think of some of that as you hear again these words. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So, what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up. And said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. From now on, sin no more. You know, in 15th century Scotland, there was a very famous trial that occurred, although nobody really remembers the criminal or the judges. Nobody's really even sure what the exact crime was. But someone was dragged into court and the person was accused of something like poaching, killing an animal for food, or hunting illegally in the woods. And nobody had actually seen the man do it. So, of course, you're asking, well, how do you prove that the guy is guilty? But the proof was in the fact that if you looked at his hands, they were still covered in blood. And a phrase came out of that that we use to this day. They said of the man that his hands were caught red. And that term now refers to a crime in which nobody doubts that there's any guilt of the one accused of the crime. You don't even need to have a trial because they say the man was caught red. Very good. Well, in our gospel reading today, the point over which nobody is debating, including even the Lord Jesus, is that the woman was caught doing exactly the thing with which she was charged. Nobody comes forward in the story to say that the scribes and the Pharisees got it all wrong, who had taken her and brought her before the Lord to accuse her. No one said they weren't telling the truth, at least, whatever their rotten motives were. Now, yeah, part of me wonders, what are these slobs, what were they doing the night before when they must have barged in on this woman? I mean, if they were really the righteous people that they told everyone they were, you'd think they would have tried to stop her from sinning out of maybe compassion for her soul. But the passage from John isn't going to make a lot of sense to us today if we don't understand that whatever the circumstances, this woman's guilty. There's no doubt that she broke the very clear law of God. Now, John's gospel today tells us that it was very early in the morning, it was near the break of day, and Jesus, who had spent the previous night out on the Mount of Olives, did what he was known to do. He went down to the temple at daybreak. He greeted the people who came to him, like that wonderful greeter you've had today. It was Wendy greeting me for this service. Um, he came and he sat down and he taught them about God's word. And then comes the irony that some individuals, these scribes and Pharisees, who are experts, at least in their mind, at the word of God, they come to him and they want to test him about the very word of God that he is teaching. Now, as I said, I don't think their motives are that particularly holy and righteous. 
I don't think they really care at all about what God's word says. Because God's word also talks about mercy and compassion. They don't want to hear about that. And I don't think they care about the woman at all. All they care about is trapping the Lord Jesus. And I'll tell you this, their plan is almost flawless. Because nobody can doubt, I'll say it again, the woman's guilty. And the law of God is very clear in these matters. Now, I will tell you, if you want to look up the law, Leviticus 20 verse 10 stated clearly that both the man and the woman involved in adultery were guilty. Where's the guy? Where's the guy in this story? They both deserve the same punishment. You could ask these hypocrites, where's the man who's just as guilty? Or Deuteronomy 22 verse 22, that's also when the law of God said, if you're going to put one to death, the other deserves the same fate. And if you let one of them go off scot-free, you got to treat the other the same way. That ain't happening by these experts of the law. But Jesus Christ is put in a real situation here. Because if he tells them, yeah, guys, uh, you got me. You got me, guys. Go ahead, stoner. I get it. Well, then they could turn and say to the Roman authorities, arrest Jesus, because only the Roman authorities claimed the right to execute criminals. And, and aside from that, at the very least, if Jesus says, go ahead and stone her, well, so much for mercy and kindness and love and all those compassionate things you've been talking about, Jesus of Nazareth. You, in the end, are nothing but a sham. So they had Jesus if he chose that option. But if the Lord, on the other hand, said, I think you ought to just release her, let her go. Then they had him there. Because what kind of teacher of the word of God deliberately ignores what the Word of God says. Either way, this is a real test of the Lord. At first, it even seems as if Jesus is kind of avoiding the question because he's feeling uncomfortable. Because all he does is he, he stoops down on the ground and starts writing on the ground. As if he's ignoring them altogether, or worse, just saying, Leave me alone, I, I really don't want to answer the question. In other words, rather than be trapped, he's just avoiding the whole issue. And, and that's fine, I guess that's an option. But that leaves this woman doomed. And the scribes and the Pharisees, oh, they even seem to relish this moment. Because the language of John's gospel says they kept on pressing him. They kept on pressing him. Oh, no, Jesus. You're not getting off that easy. We're not letting you off the hook. You can almost see that snidely whiplash. Ha, 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 delight in their eyes. The smile on their faces. Boys, we got them. We finally got them. We got them. Then it says Jesus stood up. Because he knew the law of Moses better than they did. Moses said, if you are going to stone a person, then the ones who are the witnesses that have brought the accusations, they are the ones who have to begin the execution. They have to throw the first stones before anyone else can join in. So the Lord faces the accusers. And he doesn't deny the charges. He simply tells them, okay, here you go. You're going to put yourselves in the place of God. You're going to judge as if you were God. Then you better be as holy as God is when you judge as God. When you pronounce a verdict before you throw the stone. Famous preacher a couple centuries ago. His name was George Wesley. He came to America. And on the journey with a friend who had come over from England with him, an incident occurred 
where Wesley's friend was the victim of some kind of injustice. And being a pastor, Wesley, George Wesley, told his friend, let it go. Just, just forgive, forgive and forget. And the man responded to him, oh no, I don't forgive. I'd never forgive. Never. I'm a man of justice. It's wrong. I never forgive. And George Wesley said, then I hope you never sin. In other words, if forgiveness can't be part of your vocabulary, if you can never give forgiveness, then heaven help you if you ever need forgiveness. You better never sin. And that's what Jesus told the accusers that day. He said, yeah, she's guilty. I know what she deserves. Yeah, I know the law of Moses, folks. I know what it says for those who've done what she did. But let the sinless one among you, the one who can stand before God and say, I never sinned at all. Let that one be, that man among you, you be the one who starts the execution. And Jesus had them. Because there was no way any, any of them could claim to be sinless. The older guys, you know, they've been around the block a few times. And they kind of knew it. They leave early. We're out of here. Then the younger hotheads. Wait a minute. Where are you guys going? Wait, wait. When do we throw the rocks? What? What? Wait, what? Oh, oh. Okay. And they're off. And what's interesting is that in the end, you only got two people left. One of them is still guilty, condemned. And the other one is Jesus, who is in fact sinless and does have the right to carry out the very law that he as God had created long ago when he gave it to Moses on Mount Sinai. In fact, have you ever wondered like me, I've always been intrigued by one thing in this story, why Jesus at one time stooped down and wrote with his finger in the ground. Do you know that's the only verse in the whole Bible where Jesus writes something? It may be a reminder of Exodus 31, verse 18. It's a famous scene where God himself gave Moses the Ten Commandments that were written on two tablets of stone. Remember the famous picture, lots of paintings about that. This is what the Bible says. And he gave to Moses, when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. God wrote the law down on stone with the finger of God. And now in this passage, are we looking at the Lord God, Jesus Christ, being asked about the law, who is writing with his finger on the earth, the one who created the entire universe. This sinless son of God, who alone could have judged this woman with the very law which he himself had written, found a way to release her from the law. He chose forgiveness. And he chose for her the very same words that your pastor is going to give you in this church service about your forgiveness. You know, maybe there are times when you're like me and you wonder if I stood before God, and I will someday, so will you. What are we going to hear from a righteous God? Words of condemnation? Would God say to you, how dare you come to me? Get out of my sight. But instead, you hear, neither do I condemn you. You know, if ever the words of the Bible rang true, it's for this woman and it's for you. Romans 8, 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? If God forgives Who's left to condemn you? But one problem is still there. And you're probably saying, oh, couldn't you end the sermon on that note? <laughs> the problem is, there is sin here. What about that? 
what about the real fact that she is guilty? Or you and I, who really are guilty, does God just wave his hand and say to you, forget about it. I never really meant it when I gave you the Ten Commandments. I mean, come on, you're too hard on yourselves. Why don't you give yourself a break? Go home, pet the dog, have a nice dinner, watch the baseball game, because I don't take your sin seriously, and, and neither should you. If that's the case, then that is a mockery of the God who claimed to be holy and righteous and gave us the law and said, thou shalt and thou shalt not, if he didn't really care. But then I noticed something happening in our text. It's what I told you earlier. How many times Jesus stood up, stooped down, stood up, a lot up and down. But when Jesus freed this woman, it says that he specifically stood up to face her. When she's alone, it says he stood up to face her. The word in the original language is he lifted himself up. And I was reminded of St. John's other words in John 3, 14 and 15. So must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. I'm reminded of John's other words in John 12, 32 to 33. I love St. John. He's great. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. See, Jesus didn't just lift himself up in this one instance with this one guilty woman. He did it for every one of us on the cross. On that cross, Jesus didn't just wave his hand. He didn't say to all of you, just forget about your wrongs. His hand was nailed to that cross. And his shoulders carried the guilt of that woman's sin and yours and mine. How can Jesus look you in the eye today and really say to your heart, neither do I condemn you because God condemned his own son for you. Jesus suffered that condemnation for the guilt that we should have had that we couldn't deny and couldn't explain away any more than she could. And you say, was his death enough? Can I really be sure today? Was God really satisfied with that so that there is no one left in all of huge creation ever to accuse me again and ever to condemn me again? Let me give you one last facet to this story. At the very beginning, as I told you to remember, St. John told you and me that all of this occurred around daybreak, kind of at dawn, certainly the beginning of the day. And there was another daybreak and another dawn that means a lot to us Christians. It was on the Sunday after Jesus suffered the total condemnation of God for the guilt that was ours and the condemnation that should have been ours. Because Jesus, having endured our death and our hell on that Sunday, walked alive out of that tomb. We're going to celebrate that in three Sundays. We actually do every Sunday, but we're really going to celebrate it that Sunday. And the Bible is very, very clear. Where there is sin, there is death. Did not the book of Romans tell us the wages of sin is death? Romans 6, 23. If Jesus Christ had all of our sin on himself and he died for it. Now think about this. And there remained one single sin of yours or mine in him. That he had not actually won God's forgiveness for then Jesus Christ stays dead. Where there is sin, there is death. The two have got to go together. If one single, rotten, lousy, stinking sin of yours was not entirely erased by the blood of Jesus Christ, which he lovingly shed for you, then Jesus stays dead. 
But Jesus Christ walked out of that tomb alive because that sin of yours and that sin of mine and that sin of that woman is gone. They're left to rot in that empty tomb forevermore. And buried with those sins forevermore are the condemnations and the accusations, even the ones you give yourself when you look in the mirror. That's why a day will come when Jesus Christ will say to you, neither do I condemn you. Welcome to heaven. Most of the time, as I said, when I do wrong, I kind of look for excuses. And then I realize there aren't any I can make. I can't make them anymore. Any more than this guilty woman of the story could. But Jesus can forgive, and he did forgive, and he does forgive. Today he is caught in the act of grace. And you know what? He's delighted to be caught there for your sake. Why? St. John. I don't mean the slight Matthew. I don't mean the slight Mark. I don't mean the slight Luke, St. Paul, Moses. I just love John. John 3, 17. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And I guess that you probably feel the same way I do right now. If Jesus Christ so loved you and me, he so lived for you and me, he so died for you and me, he so rose again for you and me, so that we would never, never be condemned for our sins and mistakes. Like me, I bet you'd be the first one to say, Allah, this woman, I don't want to sin anymore. Lord, I don't want to sin anymore. So our prayer, God help us. God help us to be that way with his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, and victory in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. 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 All yours, Pastor. We stand to make confession of our sins in preparation for communion. Since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let us pray. O oh God, how often we fail you. With Judas, we betray you. With Peter, we stand at a distance and deny you. With the chief priests and teachers of the law, we mock you. With Pilate, we give up and wash our hands of you. With the soldiers, we wound you. Remind us how you were crushed for our iniquities and punished for our sins. Forgive us and cleanse us, Lord Jesus. Hear now our silent confession. The good news of the gospel is, as we heard earlier, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For Jesus Christ gave himself as a sin offering, the sin offering for all people of all times for all sins. And it is because of what Christ Jesus has done for you, and it is by his command that I declare to you that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sin. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also be with you. you may be seated. <laughs> 